my Tinder date, Mr. Gucci sunglasses and big talk, turned out to have more baggage than a duty-free shop. It all started with a blind swipe right, fueled by a post-work margarita and a yearning for some non-judgmental conversation. Little did I know, I'd snagged myself a front-row ticket to a reality show so bizarre it would make Jerry Springer blush. Our first date was an afternoon stroll through the park, sunshine shimmering off his ridiculously fake Ray-Bans. He bragged about being a hotshot lawyer, closing seven-figure deals like they were popcorn kernels. Impressive, sure, but the Gucci logo practically screaming counterfeit from his temples cast a skeptical shadow over his aura of success. Then came the grand final. He casually mentions needing to return a pair of faulty sunglasses to a fancy boutique downtown. I tagged along, curious to see this legal eagle in action. Inside, the scene unfolded like a bad 80s cop movie. He throws the shades on the counter with a flourish, demanding a refund. The clerk, unfazed, explains their no returns policy. His smile evaporates faster than a mojito in the Sahara. Do you know who I am? He booms, whipping out a plastic badge that glittered like a disco ball in the afternoon light. The clerk raises an eyebrow, unimpressed. He leans in, voice tripping with menace, FBI. My jaw hit the floor with a thud that echoed through the store. The clerk, bless her soul, doesn't flinch. Instead, she picks up the phone, her voice calm but firm. I'm calling the police. Impersonating a federal officer is a serious offense. Mr. Gucci's bravado deflates faster than a punctured pool float. Turns out, the badge was actually his brother-in-law's FBI business card, enlarged and laminated with some dodgy hologram. Genius, but not exactly legal. Sirens wailed in the distance. Mr. Sunglasses scrambled, muttering about misunderstandings and faulty printers. The cops arrived, confiscated the fake badge, and led him away in handcuffs, his head hanging lower than a deflated badminton birdie. It was like watching a clown car crash in slow motion, hilarious and sad all at once. News of the FBI lawyer impersonator fiasco spread like wildfire. My phone blew up with notifications, friends sending me news articles with my date's mugshot plastered across the front page. I was, as they say, Internet famous for all the wrong reasons. Fast forward to last week, and you have stage five clinger, lawyer boy, 2.0. Same app, different delusion. We exchanged a few messages, nothing exciting. Just basic getting to know you stuff. Then the red flags popped up like confetti at a victory parade. 15 minutes before our coffee date, a frantic text, just got into a car accident, but don't worry. I'll be there on Xanax. It'll ease the pain. Okay, let's unpack that. First, a car accident right before the date. Sounds fishy. Second, self-medicating with Xanax for a coffee date. Not exactly reassuring. Finally, mentioning Danax to someone in recovery. Big, flashing neon sign that says, run away screaming. So, I did what any sane person would do. I dodged that bullet with a polite but firm text explaining that maybe we weren't a good fit. Apparently, that triggered the emotional fire alarm. A barrage of texts followed, a symphony of accusations and guilt tripping that would make a telenovela writer blush. Photos of him, shirtless and weeping, were thrown into the mix. You're leaving me for someone else. He sobbed in a text message. I just took the Xanax for you. Needless to say, I blocked him faster than Usain Bolt on sugar. Dating apps, right? A land of endless possibilities, sprinkled with enough WTF moments to fill a library. But hey, at least it keeps life interesting. And who knows, maybe someday I'll find someone who can tell the difference between real Gucci and a $5 knockoff, without the drama of flashing fake badges or popping pills before a coffee date. Until then, I'll stick to margaritas and my own company. Thank you very much. The world of online dating may be a circus, but I'm done chasing the clowns. Cupid's arrow was drunk when it shot me that day. Launched right off the dating site's algorithm, 
It clattered through a maze of bad profiles before landing square in my chest. 99% compatibility. I should have known something was fishy. It turned out to be all right. A whole school of them in the form of swapped digits and dead batteries. First, the wrong number. Imagine picturing your dream girl for hours, crafting witty messages, then dialing hopeful digits only to land in voicemail oblivion. Then the date, a ghost town at the designated meeting spot. I scoured the faces, scanning for a flicker of recognition, the echo of her profile picture's faded smile. Strike one, Cupid. Back at my shoebox apartment, phone buzzing with her accusatory texts, I launched into a frantic defense. Wrong number, I babbled, mismatched digits dancing on my screen. Then, the kicker, she butchered mine too. Apparently, fate's humor wasn't limited to bad algorithms. Strike two, and I was batting average zero. Round two, new numbers, charged phones, cautious optimism. Then the tram's malicious grin as its battery meter plummeted towards coma, heart sinking faster than the metal beast, I bolted back home, a phone call the only lifeline in a sea of missed connections. To my surprise, her voice was tinged with laughter, relief washing over me like a lifeguard's rescue. We're even, she declared, and that night, over burnt crusts and bubbling mozzarella, I felt a spark that no digital glitch could extinguish. Three years, a son, and countless shared pizzas later, I still chuckle at the divine botch up that brought us together. It's a story whispered beneath starry nights, a reminder that sometimes love's grand design needs a little creative editing. Because as it turns out, a 99% match can become 100% real, even if the road there's paved with wrong numbers and dead batteries. West Hollywood, summer 2006. Oh, Cupid was still a wild west back then, tumbleweeds of hope rolling through pixelated profiles. I stumbled upon hers, a sun-kissed smile and a bio that promised witty banter and a love of vintage vinyl. We clicked, met for dinner, and that's where the tumbleweeds turned into a dust storm. She was different, bigger than her pictures, sure, but it wasn't just the extra pounds. It was an aura, a restless energy that vibrated around her like a hummingbird on Red Bull. Turns out, the buzz wasn't just metaphorical. Bathroom breaks became her personal powder rooms, punctuated by the unmistakable crunch of dollar bills and the faint scent of something chemical. Dinner was a blur of barely touched food and her rambling tales of being Ozzy Osbourne's cardiologist's daughter. The air crackled with a nervous energy my appetite chased away by the suspicion that simmered in my gut. Back at her place, the night took a turn into a dark alley. She slipped something into my drink, a glint in her eyes that sent shivers down my spine. Before I could react, she was on me, demanding my tiger up. It was a twisted request, fueled by whatever cocktail of drugs and desire swirled in her system. I refused, of course, the line between fantasy and reality blurred beyond recognition. Then came the garage, my car trapped inside like a fly in a honey jar. She wouldn't let me leave, her laughter echoing in the darkness, a cruel symphony of paranoia and power. I spent the night in my car, watching the sunrise paint the sky with ironic hues of hope. Finally, a resident leaving offered me escape, a lifeline thrown across the chasm of that bizarre night. Three days later, the phone call, a voice thick with accusation, claiming a miscarriage, blaming me. I was stunned, speechless. The weight of her words crashed upon me, a monstrous lie fueled by who knows what twisted narrative she'd woven in her mind. That night in West Hollywood, with its whispered promises and spiked drinks, became a ghost in my life. A reminder of the dark corners that lurk behind the screens, of the shadows that dance in the glow of digital connections. It was a cautionary tale, whispered in the dusty echoes of a mismatched date, a stark lesson in the importance of listening to your gut, even when it screens over vintage vinyl and sun-kissed smiles. And while the echoes of that night may fade, the scar remains, a reminder to tread carefully in the online wilderness, 
to keep my eyes peeled for the mirages that shimmer in the heat of desire, and to trust my instincts, even when they whisper of danger in the heart of a summer night. IRC, a digital playground where pixels pulsed with whispered secrets and laughter crackle through dial-up connections. There, beneath the neon glow of usernames, I met Jenny, witty, wry, a wisp of a girl with a penchant for self-deprecating humor. Ten years younger, she claimed, but eighteen, she insisted, and across continents, I believed her. One summer, Florida sunshine traded for Danish drizzle. My apartment became her haven, or so I thought. Photos, distorted prisms of reality, had masked the reality. A hurricane of drama wrapped in a 150-centimeter frame. Her world, a labyrinth of deceit, unraveling thread by thread. Lies about age, spun like cotton candy, burst into bitter truth on the eve of her departure. Sixteen, not eighteen, a child playing grown-up. Exhaustion gnawed at my sanity. Her histrionics, a symphony of wails and wall punches, orchestrated around my misplaced expectations. She devoured food like a bottomless pit, leaving a trail of dirty utensils in her wake. My immaculate space, transformed into a war zone of spilled cereal and mismatched socks. Desperate, I enlisted reinforcements. Hank and Gabby, a beacon of American calm in Jenny's emotional typhoon. Their arrival, a catalyst. One hysterical hour later, a passport lay open, stark evidence of a fabricated age. Sixteen. Guilt gnawed at my gut, bitter bile in the face of my navet. We packed her bags, a silent ballade of suitcases and unspoken disappointment. The bathroom door creaked open, revealing a watery scene. Jenny perched on the drain, a miniature island in a flood of her own making. One last act, defiant yet pathetic. The next morning, tearful goodbyes and slammed doors. Relief, acrid on my tongue, a stark contrast to the sweetness of freedom. But her grip, it seemed, wouldn't loosen. A phone symphony of missed calls, a digital stalker lurking in a sea of unanswered emails. One outburst too many, my patience shattered. A primal scream of frustration, a desperate plea for solitude. I slammed the phone, severed the digital cord, and vowed silence. Life moved on, bathed in the warm glow of normalcy. My Japanese beauty, a love story eight years in the making, neared its culmination. Her arrival, a promise whispered on the wind, a balm to the wounds of deceit. Jenny, a fading echo in the rearview mirror, a cautionary tale woven into the fabric of my past. A reminder that behind digital masks, truth, fragile and elusive, awaits to be revealed. And sometimes, silence is the only answer to the cacophony of lies. The salty scent of anticipation hung in the air as I waited for my date. Navy boy, as my friends called him, had spun a charming web of witty banter and adventurous promises online. I pictured a sun-kissed sailor, strong and capable, with a twinkle in his ocean blue eyes. Instead, a mustard yellow Camaro, pulsating like a demented bumblebee, screeched to a halt. A sheepish grin peeked out from behind the driver's window, framed by a uniform that looked slightly too tight. Oh boy, parking, apparently, was an optional skill. With a lurch and a grind, the Camaro performed a delicate ballet against the innocent white sedan beside it, leaving a sunflower trail of yellow paint. My eyebrows did a synchronized tango towards my hairline. Ah, uh, maybe we should park somewhere else. Navy boy suggested, the nonchalance in his voice inversely proportional to the neon scar he'd just inflicted on someone else's property. The rest of the date unfolded like a bad rom-com written by a seagull on amphetamines. The scorching sun beat down on the boardwalk, turning the asphalt into a molten river. Navy boy's conversation, much like his driving, lacked direction and finesse. He tripped over his own words, name-dropping battleships like they were his weekend brunch buddies, seeking refuge from the heat and the Navy's dubious tales of heroic hijinks. We stumbled into the nearest air-conditioned haven, a movie theater. Little did we know, 
We were about to embark on a cinematic odyssey, not of Jason Statham's finest, but of everyone's favorite green ogre. Shrek the final chapter it was. Now, I'm not a movie snob, but watching an animated ogre battle a dragon while perched on someone else's footstool felt slightly unromantic. Navy Boy, however, seemed perfectly at ease, his size 12s claiming territorial rights over the seats in front of us, like a particularly pungent barnacle. Enter the hero of the evening, a beleaguered dad clutching a sticky-fingered toddler and radiating the desperate hope of a man seeking 10 minutes of peace. He eyed the only vacant seats, those currently occupied by my date's oversized appendages. A silent standoff ensued. Navy boy, oblivious to the social faux pas he was tap dancing on, remained firmly planted. The dad, his patience wearing thinner than a used tea bag, cleared his throat. Still nothing. Finally, exasperated, I nudged Navy boy's ankle. He grunted, shifted slightly, and managed to whack the dad in the back of the head with his heel. The look on the dad's face was a tragicomedy in itself, a mixture of disbelief, annoyance, and the kind of soul-crushing resignation that only parenthood can cultivate. My feet were there first, Navy boy mumbled, as if that justified his impromptu footsie with the poor man's skull. Needless to say, dinner was a hard pass, as he dropped me off, miraculously without losing any limbs or transmissions. He chirped, so when can I see you again? I had a great time. I stared at him, the echo of Shrek's triumphant roar still ringing in my ears. Navy boy, I said my voice laced with the kind of steel only forged in the fires of awkward dates. The only thing I'm seeing again is the inside of my eyelids in the dark, alone. And with that, I turned and fled, leaving him alone with his borrowed Camaro and his questionable grasp of social etiquette. As for me, I learned a valuable lesson that day. Some mysteries are best left unraveled, especially those cruising around in canary-colored Camaros. And maybe, just maybe, stick to landlubbers next time.